Hello all, and this video is going to be an assortment of different phenomenological projects to come out of the European tradition in the 20th century. Since we just did a full video on Jean-Paul Sartre, I figured we could look at some of his critiques and how they film in before finishing up with hermeneutics language and an introduction to Derrida. At least that will be the goal for this video. Um, but if we we're going to start off with our third, our first thinker, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Gabriel Marcel, who was a uh, French Catholic. Um, he, of course, uh, I think I mentioned him before in a past video uh, with the method of phenomenology. He uh, took umbrage, of course, with Sarch's uh, nihilism and um, existential um, um, you know, theories and so he uh, delineates away and goes towards a life philosophy of uh, phenomenology or a religious existential um, view which could be rather interesting to look at um, but I also wanted to really go with Maurice Marlou Ponte who has a very interesting look at the subject and object dichotomy that has really dominated philosophical discussion uh, really as post-Kantians. <clears throat> and so he criticizes uh, not just Kant but Sarch with the dialectic of subject and object uh, in that sort of dichotomy. Um, Sarch of course has being in nothingness or uh, for myself uh, in and of itself. Um, Ponty has a problem with uh, the ostracizing of the subject um, and so he wants to maintain a personal identity rather than the repetitious recreation of the ego that uh, Sarch put forth. So he wants to examine other aspects of subjectivity through perception and um, just a, as an aside uh, Tyler Hamilton on his channel had a really uh, uh, well done discussion on uh, Ponty and um, perception that I would recommend uh, it's certainly more dense and thorough than what I'm going to do here for you um, and so he sets forth with the lived body or bodily experience which if we were going to look at the Sarchian uh, way of things this was the lived throughness that he described um, concrete experience comes out of our bodily lived uh, influence and so he takes the influence of embodied cognition being more than just you know stimulus uh, you know affecting uh, the mind but um, consciousness being in the world itself uh, it's not relegated to you know mind or perception um, if we were gonna look at Descartes for example with the Kajito uh, it's a sort of locus of the self uh, which is always in engagement but exceeds environment and choices that change ourselves as uh, always active and so this reinvigorates the idea of subjectivity um, so Ponty um, he has the he's very influential in this text towards the embodied cognition uh, which has come uh, through in contemporary thought and so being is more than just stimulus but it's the consciousness of being in the world itself and so for Ponty, subjectivity um, is you know present in the world and engaging with it, as opposed to uh, the cogito where the subjectivity, you know, is suspended and 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 there's that sort of separation between the two. And so there's an interesting way of looking at you know politics and health and uh, other matters with this. You know, Ponty view of subjectivity, um, you know, where you can find perhaps the common world and common good as opposed to 
the realization of this subjective uh, freedom uh, that uh, he's opposed here. So instead of you know having these you know abstract theories towards you know freedom or psychology or even behaviorism, we have instead this you know lived body uh, that's not separate from you know entities or you know these abstract concepts but actually towards the experience coming out of you know your own lived body uh, this is of course how he deals with empiricism or his problem with it um, you can see this you know with um, you know uh, you know if, if, if everything was just in this sort of abstract way of looking at things we could just solve you know everything was just you know simple Google searches on things like your health or something like that you wouldn't need to have you know primary care and, and, and being looked at to look at to have the perspective of your lived body uh, you know in experience and seeing what actually is right for you or you know uh, right for your state of mind uh, or your cognition even and so um, you have uh, what he calls the problem and promise and so each phenomenon uncovered becomes more complex such as intentional acts or the Husserlian view of expression and indication um, so you know as you take on more experience or, or phenomenon or examine you know questions of being or something like that um, you know, it, it becomes more complex. Certainly, uh, when you have dialogues with people, you you know you get uh, nuance or something like that. And um, so it's very interesting to see, you know, how Ponty has these different answers as compared to Sarch, who of course uh, became more famous um, and kind of overtook him in uh, philosophical fame, if you will. Uh, even though Ponty, uh, you know, was, you know, somewhat friendly towards Sarch, of course, uh, but still, you know, has his own critiques of, uh, you know, Sarch's um, dialectic of uh, being and, and nothing, um, or absence even. Uh, it's more um, nuanced than that. There's more to uh, intentionality, I would think. Uh, in Ponty's uh, way of looking at it. And so if we we're going to look at the intentional arc, which is the experience of the movement of the body creates in this you know, lived space in pre, uh, uh, pre-apprehension as opposed to Kant's view of uh, apprehension. What one can do as opposed to what one thinks by being thrust into being in the world. There's a sort of Heideggerian um, uh, way of looking at um, the action of Dasein, uh, I kind of think of here, uh, where, you know, you're thrown into the world, and uh, so what are you going to actually uh, do as opposed to, you know, being locked away in a stove-heated room and, you know, thinking of these abstract uh, concepts. And so he has a critique uh, if we're going to move along here, that a uh, brain or consciousness takes over the synthesis of stimulus and restricts us from the actual objects um, in the world. So he's taking a look at the scientific objective base that you know misses the ambiguity uh, necessary in these uh, primitive acts uh, in the world, and so. You know, he's really, you know, getting at empiricism and, you know, the use of, of stimulus that, you know, simply, you know, having, you know, you know drinking a coffee, uh, for example, if we're going to be uh, a bit mundane about this here, you know, drinking a coffee in the morning after you wake up to energize your day is much different than drinking a coffee you know, at seven o'clock at night, trying to you know power through YouTube videos. Um, certainly, uh, you know, you get more out of it in the morning when you're you know more fresh, 
uh, fresh off of a, you know resting or something like that, as opposed to already being haggard uh, from the day and um, you know taking in caffeine, despite the fact that you know it's the same stimulus, of course. Um, but the empiricist view kind of you know misses that there's going to be different perceptions. Uh, at different times, even if the subject is the same, such as yourself. Um, and so he, you know, he takes shape with that, you know, one on one to one, you know, sort of ratio. And so the in itself and for itself dichotomy, uh, the discovery of the origin or appearance of being and the paradox of for us in and of itself um, is the engagement through being lived body of, per of perception as opposed to nothingness of Sarch in human projects or identities. And so this is, you know, kind of a rough shot of what Ponty looked to do in, in his, uh, you know, look at perceptions and um, his problems with empiricism and uh, the scientific base of, um, you know, objective towards, you know, things like stimulus and, um, you know, missing out on what, you know, the lived body and being in the world actually means in an ambiguous way. So if we're going to move on from Ponty, I want to look at Paul Ricoeur and his uh, hermeneutic uh, phenomenology of interpretation of human life, uh, which has to do with the voluntary and involuntary experience of freedom in interpretation. He's trying to open up that, you know, dialectic of uh, interpretation and, um, um, you know, being for yourself and um, the, uh, the concept of phenomenon out of that. Um, and so, you know, you have different interpretations such as, you know, the feeling of guilt or you know, something along those lines is trying to build on, um, you know, an ethical way of looking at uh, these sort of things, uh, which was, you know, fleshes out much more than just, um, you know, the polarity uh, between the two that we see in someone like Sarge. But if we're going to move along here through these phenomenologists, then we'll go to Tillich who has an interesting work on the dynamics of faith. Uh, the phenomenon of faith is what he focuses on as, you know, the ultimate concern. He's a theological, uh, you know, has a theological basis really for his investigations. Um, the, the, uh, the ultimate concern of faith is the centered act that, you know, molds being into intentionality to begin with, at least to Tillich. Um, you know, it's sort of that pre, uh, prehension uh, dynamic of how intentionality would even come about to begin with, which is actually really interesting because I never really looked at Tillich before. And if you look at the end of my Sarch video, I kind of, um, you know, mess around with the sort of ideas of how, you know, the way intentionality works, the way the ego works, according to Sarch, it's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, you you end up with, uh, you know, a concept like nothingness or not being able to apprehend noumena at all. It's as if, you know, noumena set in the motion or God in this case set in the motion of, you know, needing faith, uh, you know, instead of, you know, just having an empirical way of, you know, examining, uh, God, uh, God himself or his own, uh, creation, um, which I think is really interesting to, you know, look at Sarch, uh, considering he, in the end, ended up converting, at least as the legend goes with him. But now I wanted to focus on the hermeneutic aspect of this video. And of course, this starts with uh, Gadamer. And so Gadamer, uh, you know, goes through the enlightenment of objective epistemology of objects, um, and written texts towards a hermeneutical understanding and a non-objective understanding. And so let's not forget with the Copernican revolution that as good post-Kantians, of course, we bring our own grids to 
uh, you know, reading uh, material, materials or interpretation that we impose, our subjective grids, our, you know, Kantian categories, if we were going to use the term of, um, you know, our subjective grids of what we think or do. Um, and then he also synthesizes this with uh, Schleiermarker, who, you know, was focused on that subjective grid of uh, author intentionality uh, or the grid to emphasize on the intentionality of his view of idealism at the time. Uh, and then, of course, with Husserl, uh, the intentionality was the uh, constitutive act in the act of interpretive reading uh, to bring, you know, the meaning myself into the act of uh, reading. And so, <clears throat> of course, I'm using a bunch of different thinkers here that Gadamer, uh, you know, mashes together to get his uh, hermeneutic concepts through. Um, Heidegger, of course, takes the understanding of being in the world as Dasein. So how I understand is my own subjective grid or intentionality, uh, if we were going to take how Heidegger, uh, you know, reverses Husserl. And so um, the gap of interpretation for historical materials for mutual understanding. So a dialogue, of course, is a two-way street with two subjectivities or horizons or perspectives. You know, when you're reading ancient Greek philosophy, of course, you're taking, you know, the subjectivity of the ancient Greeks and the subjectivity of you, you know, in today's world. And, you know, you're, you're having a dialogue, you know, within the act of reading, um, you know, those two different grids come together to form a new perspective, which I also... Um, what I found really interesting, though, about Gadamer, uh, when you look at hermeneutic theory, is, you know, there's always these historical metaphors, you know, we're always using, especially when it comes to politics and talking of civilization. The classic example being, you know, throughout my life, there's always the comparison of us to Rome, which I think is, of course, an apt <clears throat> comparison. Um, but... You know, I think that there is, you know, something to be said about how, you know, when you look at historical texts, um, it seems like, um, you know, these metaphors or these analogies that we seem to pull out, um, they reveal themselves to us through, uh, you know, these subjective grids or uh, interpretation. So what might be precedent for us, you know, now might not be so 30 years from now, we might be looking at you know, different thinkers or different philosophers, kind of like how I suggested earlier with Ponty uh, as compared to Sarch. Um, you know, Ponty was kind of overtaken in interest and popularity, even though in his, you know, time of like the 50s and 60s, he actually was, you know, far more popular. Um, now we're going back and looking through it and, you know, maybe we'll be able to say, hey, the lived body uh, phenomenology might have more to it than uh, what Sartre was saying. And so I think it's interesting to look at historicism from that angle. Um, you know, you see all the time now, Oswald, Oswald Spangler gets mentioned quite often, especially in, uh, you know, uh, the right wing scene on uh, the internet now. Uh, he's definitely one of the more influential figures out there. Uh, Spangler wasn't all that popular. And as John David Ebert would say, you know, maybe in the 90s or early 2000s. Um, but now that we look back, of course, and we're becoming more concerned with the state of our civilization today, uh, someone like Spangler becomes more interesting to us. And so uh, it's interesting to see how uh, that comes about. But I wanted to look at some of Gadamer's terminology here uh, with prejudice. Uh, which is the pre-judgment or pre-understanding. So, you know, anytime you go and start a text, I, I think I mentioned this on Twitter, but not in an actual video. You know, I had some presuppositions about looking at someone like Whitehead. I didn't think that it was going to be that interesting, but he actually ended up being one of the more interesting thinkers that I've done videos on. 
in his uh, metaphysics, and uh, I found it very um, compelling and interesting. So I went in with the prejudice or prejudgment towards the text. Um, but, you know, as you read it, as you examine the text um, through subjective understanding, um, it, it modifies as the dialogue goes on. My grid changes as I, you know, took on Whitehead's uh, grid as an author. And so um, one of the main ideas of common language or cultural connection through linguistics that makes the dialogue possible or effective uh, effective history, which is a Gadamer term. Um, and then I also wanted to lay a precursor here with critical realism, which is of course the representational theory of knowledge from prior to now a phenomenological uh, basis, which gives you the existence of the object in intentionality um, and not infallible interpretation. Um, I think the best way to look at this before we uh, actually go forward with thinkers who actually are into critical realism is how Thomas Reed, uh, you know, maintains in Scottish realism that you know there's an immediate awareness of existence of things, um, or you know we have a self evidence, uh, uh, you know, or signs that the objects that we are uh, examining in our immediacy are um, actually you know there, or you know we have signifiers. Now of course signifiers might light some light bulbs to some of the viewers here because this leads into uh, Derrida who of course is the famous uh, father figure of deconstructionism. Uh, Derrida is an anti-realist. Uh, texts cannot have any fixed meaning because of the language structure given by author in an unconscious fashion. Um, you know we see this all the time with an author, you know, putting forth their creative work, thinking that people are going to take it one way and they actually take it a, a totally different way. Um, so the author, of course, has no idea how uh, one might interpret their text. Um, texts usually can take a life of their own, things that might end up being interesting to you and your subjective grid or your hermeneutic way of interpretation uh, might not be of interest to you know the next reader next to you or for that matter you know when the author puts forth they might not realize necessarily and I certainly have felt this way with some of my uh, early essays that I've been putting out on the channel um, you know uh, you know ideas seem to resurface you know within the mind that you didn't really uh, think was happening and so you know there is a um, you know he's kind of picking apart here that you know with hermeneutics even though you're having a dialogue perhaps um, you can't actually you know fixate on you know what the meanings actually are um, so he has an anti-realist look about interpretation and thus that gives plurality and of course we're going to see with how he you know views you know, breaking down of, you know, metaphysical polarities, uh, which will give way to play or, um, you know, the trace, as we'll see. Um, and so um, we've really summarized here a lot of the European tradition of phenomenology, um, although I'm going to do a full video probably on uh, Derrida's grammatology since it's so influential today. Um, but, uh, you know, we're going to also look at how the European tradition going forward is going to get picked up by the Anglo and American tradition as you go through the second half of the 20th century. So you have the common theme of uh, no truth about anything in the objective sense. Um, you know, the mirror of nature or copies of nature. Um, and so you can't have really any realist uh, image of, of nature, um, which then, of course, in the classic philosophical move of 
you know, a lack of certainty towards these things, you end up with skeptics. And so, obviously, in this tradition, you end up with no absolute certainty about any sort of epistemological grounds. And then um, this also extends toward linguistics, as we'll see. There's a skepticism emerging in the 20th century towards interpretation and how um, um, you have this sort of ambiguity, you know, within texts, within what prior thinkers actually was uh, thinking or what they actually truly meant. Um, and of course, this has huge implications for theology and hermeneutics. Um, you know, uh, there's different levels of meaning within texts, of course. Um, and so, you know, you could actually go all the way back to Aquinas and what he, you know, interpreted of, you know, biblical symbolisms at different levels, uh, different interpretations that he actually put forth. Um, and even when you look at something like the New Testament as compared to the Old Testament, um, there's, a, there's a dialect really in the New Testament of, um, you know, when, um, you know, God punishes, this is actually, you know, setting forth uh, the way towards the second coming and, and resurrection, whereas, of course, you don't find that in the Old Testament. And so it's really interesting to look at, you know, these different ways in which, as history moves along, these different interpretations seem to rise up. And um, as we'll get with Derrida, he's trying to peel back um, to let play happen with all of these interpretations and, you know, bring about a plurality of different meanings um, that will uh, be peeled back from our metaphysical suppositions in language and um, just um, arts in general. Um, but yeah, this is a summation video, a assortment of different phenomenological projects to come out of the 20th century in the European traditional sense. And uh, I hope you guys stick around for the video on Derrida uh, and grammatology. Uh, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, comment for the algorithm, of course. And uh, I'll see you for the next one.